So, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the final panel of Urban Arc 2023. Um, we've got a set of very interesting papers uh, on uh, a whole range of different aspects of broadly governance. Um, we'll go as per the order in the schedule. Um, the only thing is the last speaker on the schedule, um, Sanhita Joshi, won't be joining us. So um, the format, I think, remains the same as we've held to for the rest of the conference. Um, given that we're one speaker short, each of the panelists can take about 15 minutes. Um, folks online, you'll please keep an eye on the chat box. You'll get a um, time warning there, and folks here, um, Ruchika will be helping with that. Um, and so without further ado, um, we'll start with uh, Sakshi. Hello, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Sakshi Saxena from uh, SEPT University. I'll be uh, presenting my screen now. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, all good. If yeah. you just go to slideshow. Great. Uh, so I would be presenting my paper today, which is Power Over the Environment, Investigating the Nature of Transactions Behind Violations Along Bangalore Lakes. So guys, uh, did you know that Bangalore today has lost four-fifths of its water bodies over a period of 47 years within the BBMP area, at least more than 50% of the historic irrigation tanks have been uh, compromised? as a cost to uh, the rapid development. And the WRI report also suggests that the city is growing by at least 60 square kilometer per year, which has resulted into land reclamation, lake edge urbanization, and lake contamination. So lakes and tanks that have been part of the ecological and cultural heritage are slowly depleting and are disappearing gradually from the city's maps. I uh, did a series of literature review, which helped me to understand uh, that where are the missing gaps. So, uh, you know, like there's a lack in visualizing lakeside real estate development in Bangalore from a long term perspective. And it is therefore important to understand. As per the uh, forest department, also the historic irrigation tanks have begun to be called as lakes and seen interchangeably. Therefore, uh, like now that they're being polluted, we need to look upon that. And the research significance is to question the ambivalent premise of violations to understand how people in positions of power are dealing with uh you know authorities to claim these watersheds and analyze the nature of businesses involved it shall be presented in a law and regulatory analysis and suggestions format and it shall be limited to belindu lake and its surrounding luxury real estate with the lens of ecological justice so the study aims to ask whether negotiations around lakes involve violations, which is breaking any law, or rather they are just mismanaged institutional arrangements, which is the nature of organizations and regulations and their interaction with one another. I would like to show a small video here. Over the years, it is apparent that the concerns with lakes for the influential and powerful of the city seems to be only aesthetic elements of it and recreation and property values, anything that could monetize. So the planning bodies are not defining any stark boundaries, whereas informal arrangements take advantage of unclear laws. For the scope of this project, three bodies of work, private, public, and civic are discussed, which have their own set of institutional arrangements and sometimes have contradicting interests. However, they all interact with each other through deals and negotiations to come to agreements for the development works in the city of Bangalore. For the purpose of this research, the focus shall remain on deals around Belindu Lake, which is located in the Koramangala Chalagatta Valley in the southern Bangalore and was said to be built around 130 years ago. It has almost reduced today by 100 acres in size, according to reports, owing to encroachments, uh, encroachments all around it. So uh, the first impression of this lake was a smelly drain and sewage dumping ground, but it has many other characteristics and complicated land dynamics owing to its, la owing to its large expanse, which is around 3.62 kilometers in length. 
there are so many construction areas temples burial grounds uh, around the lake which makes it difficult to access also slowly it, it was observed to be a cattle rearing ground or highly uh, fenced urban lake as if trying to hide something like projects like euphoria and embassy completely blocked its downstream access the uh, this observation when compared to that of a thriving similar sized hesagatta lake on the outskirts of the city showed how urbanization affected this lake to completely rob it of its character the unfair gap of research on this domain seemed to be a comprehensive study which tried uh, tries to suggest for a better and transparent negotiation process and raise the question who loses on account of state led depletion of ecologically sensitive tanks and other seemingly passive violations so uh, like some stakeholder uh, like interactions were done and uh to gather this uh, to gather understanding from the stakeholders involved seven scholar uh, developers interviewed as a part of the structural discussions there is a mix of 30 group or uh, 35 migrants and locals were surveyed the interview suggested that there are issues with governance legality of land conversion processes tools of measuring impact some deals and various myths and narratives such as lakes being man made and uh, or natural created by negotiators some also mentioned the presence of land mafia which was confirmed by some readings there as the surveys depicted clearly how people felt left out of the planning processes when it came to lakes and tanks and that surround them that led uh, us to the question what are the many laws and regulations that cause uh, regulatory ambiguity and how are they affecting the environment and stakeholders of bangalore's lakes so to decode the regulatory ambiguity previous and current master plans various levels of classifications of custodianship of these lakes from concerned authorities and other violator practices was analyzed to find that uh, you know different sorry for the first comparison of 2015 and 2031 master plans was done to find out some positive changes envisioned however in order to enact them good governance is essential bangalore master plans 1984 to 2031 lacked spatial economics uh, vision uh, and ecological vision for the bangalore tanks apart from this there also exists a plurality in custodianship of lakes there exist two regulatory bodies on the national scale five on state three on the city level each with a different overlapping function which makes it easier to shift the blame when it comes to lakes and tanks many guidelines at the national level too are ambivalent and vague one such example is the environment impact assessment whose unclear terms of reference in the documents itself created a loophole somewhere, somewhere for approval of hungry developers there is a space for multiple organizations to interact and uh, new projects from remote or remote locations due to the system now there is plural terminology as well so due to overlapping functions there are plural terminology such as four terminologies for the definition of the word buffer which is very essential uh, which is a very essential term for lakes so uh, like ngt bbmp bda and the forest department all of them had different definitions for the word buffer conclusion so far be this regulatory ambiguity leads into questioning the word violations and into discovering various deals and negotiations and institutional arrangements around these lakes and tanks 
For this research, the highlighted part of the Belengo region, which is the downstream area, shall be taken into consideration to understand the deals and negotiations between real estate and the government which took place here. As highlighted, there are four major types of players, public, private, individual, and the fourth is the agricultural landowners. However, in the downstream area, only private real estate uh, players exist on the lake edge. Um, it is not just this or other projects on the edge of the Belandur Lake, which, which caused the issue. There's also, this is also largely connected to the Chalaghatta Lake upstream, which was supposed to fill Belandur Lake uh, with rainwater, but its disappearance is also a crucial deal to study. This lake was established in 1924 and is now a golf course in the same area. It was a public-private partnership of a small level between the state uh, and the private trust, which promised to build a world-class golf course, but the lake was completely seen as a parcel of land that the government took over uh, as uh, given on lease. Uh, this depicts the power with the government that leads to ecological injustice sometimes. Another similar but even worse case was of the Dharmabuddhi tank, which was once the most important lake of Bangalore, but now is a concretized burst terminal, which floods every year due, during rains, owing to its low-lying topographical location, since it was a lake. So why build, uh, why buy and build in lake vicinities is a, is a question that helps to analyze the behavior of parties involved. Consumers buy this property for the refreshing microclimate and a sense of community, but also because of the luxury tag uh, of real, lake view real estate, which is created by builders uh, to be taking advantage of the prime locations of the city. Whereas the developers chose lake view real estate because high price and uh, the prime location uh, was here. So leading to all these events for some unaccounted for effects on the environment. Even if these lakes are man-made, how the narrative suggests, about 1400 of them once kept the city cool and affected the surface temperatures, groundwater recharge, overall microclimate, which cannot be ignored. Okay, I'll uh, wrap up soon. So uh, coming uh, forward to the conclusion, So uh, an analytic fr analytical framework was chosen and the research was designed in such a way to come to the conclusion that after many interactions and discussions, one common theme emerged that at the federal level, numerous bodies and departments collaborate, yet the arbitrary nature of the structure of multiple government bodies causes blame to be shifted on one another. While investigating issues uh, with these two organizations is evident that while uh, Lake Authority is only acting as a work monitor in shifting blames, uh, Vivempra, on the other hand, was motivated to collect penalties rather than demolish these real estate uh, buildings because each building is a source of taxation as well, uh, which is ultimately the revenue stream not enforcing the law all, uh, and no accountability for its actions. Due to the mismanaged uh, institutional arrangements, violations, and micromanagement by influential and narratives created for vested interest, it is the lakes, the city, the people, and the government which loses as a whole. Some suggestions were made to the master planning process at three levels, national, master, le master plan level, and action or administrative level, which are shown as follows. A protection of major drains through edge plantations and protection of lake upstream and downstream, series points uh, filling, natural lake filter filtering systems such as algae islands, enactment of the buffer zone uh, in a retrospective manner, clear and detailed specific site studies uh, before any uh, project comes up at the edge of the lake. And at the master plan level, the authority shall take the responsibility to provide a vision for every uh, lake and keep it ecologically sound. At the action level, there should be awareness amongst all stakeholders and they shall take responsibility and raise voice to check the loopholes in the system in order to coexist with the environment. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sakshi, uh, and also thank you very much for your timeliness. Um, it's actually really, really interesting, and um, particularly the the question of fragmented governance across scales. Um, I think I'll, I'd just like to leave you with a question that maybe you can come back to later, is sure. to reflect on how <clears throat> the the floods in Bangalore and the sort of subsequent policy impact of those, and you know, sort of what has been in in your research the implication and the impact of those. Um, so uh, we now have someone here presenting. So over to you, Janaka. Sure, I'll just drop in. Yes, please. Mic's on, isn't it? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so my presentation is about a case study which we came across as part of a broader study um, titled UKRI GCRF, Rethinking the Off-Grid City, uh, which aims to reimagine uh, infrastructure, infrastructure's role uh, in supporting the lives of marginalized communities. So the case study is about how the physicality of infrastructure uh, and urban space located within a city in flux uh, entangles with the everyday lives of people. And also about how an ambivalent form of governance of a communally maintained household water connection serves a group much larger than those who labor to make it work. Um, the study site is in Sivalipura, uh, located to the south of Colombo's oldest tenement garden, uh, known as Vanath Mulla. Uh, border, it's bordered by a railway track to the west uh, and by a road to the east and has an uh, open canal flowing through the middle. Over successive on-site upgrade programs taking place in Vanath Mulla uh, since the late uh, 1970s, the urban space of Sivalipura gradually changed. A key focus of the first two programs taking place in one of uh, the uh, first two programs was providing basic services such as water and sanitation related infra infrastructure to communities living in tenement gardens. The, uh, the urban basic services improvement program uh, or the UBSIP also empowered communities to organize themselves through community groups uh, called Community Development Councils, or CDCs, which will come up a bit later in the presentation as well, uh, to facilitate community participation in the program and were mobilized during subsequent projects and programs as well. For example, during the Million Houses program, or the MHP, pro uh, which provided uh, not only financial services to low-income households, but also conducted uh, community uh, action planning methodologies as well. Also mobilized CDCs uh, to facilitate, uh, to coordinate, execute, and monitor the program. And due to its innovative participatory nature, uh, it, the MHP was also awarded the World Habitat Award in 1988. The current uh, location of water infrastructure available within Sivalipur is shown in the map. Almost all of them are wells. The case study I wish to talk about is the square next to the arrow, uh, which is a public toilet with a household water connection attached to it. However, when speaking to uh, a member of a CDC, uh, she mentioned that in the 1980s, public taps were actually the primary source of water for many in Sivalipura until the early 2000s. The table shows the periods of time these taps were in operation. It's not a perfect data set. Uh, when you speak to the people in Sivalipura, they might remember a tap being in a, within a particular vicinity, but not remember exactly where it is. Uh, and in other, uh, uh, in other cases, you would see the tap, but not exactly uh, have much more information about it. But what's interesting about it is the fact that uh, in 1980, uh, during those on-site upgrade programs were taking place, many of those taps were, uh, were brought into operation. And if you look at the blue bars, uh, it's in the early 2000s that those taps stopped being, uh, uh, were actually removed. And that's because of what's, uh, what was called the Randia program, which came into operation by the National Water Supply and Drainage Board, which is the nation, national supplier of treated water. Um, with, and this Randia program, the main uh, intention was to provide household water, make it easier for household water connections to be provided 
but in return, the water board uh, notified the CDCs that it will be replacing public taps with household water, con uh, with the, uh, water connections. Um, it's important to uh, think about the importance of uh, household water connections here because household water connections aren't just a way in which to obtain treated water um, because the water bills are actually acceptable proof uh, which people can use when applying for a bank loan. Uh, and also when it comes to enrolling children uh, to schools. Um, and also the replacement of public taps with uh, household connections was also a means by which the water board uh, was promoting demand responsive approaches to reduce non-revenue water and treat water more like a commodity rather than a public good. So hopefully the history that I mentioned about the various programs that took place um, uh, in Sivalipura will provide important uh, context to the case study which I'm about to talk about. Um, so the case study that I'm focused on is uh, this uh, public toilet uh, within Sivalipura, um, and uh, which was built in the early, uh, which was built during the 1980s again during those on-site uh, development programs which were taking place. And in the early 2000s, a public tap was fixed to the toilet. But around 2013, the water board decided to remove it, but in return offered the connection of a household water connection, so long as somebody from the community takes, uh, takes responsibility for it. Two people came forward. Uh, one was Kamal, who was living in a house occupying state land, uh, who put his name down as the owner of the water connection. Kumudini also came forward and offered her address uh, for billing purposes. This was because uh, Kamal's uh, tenor position was precarious. He did not have a formal address because he was occupying state lands. Um, in fact, um, the, there were many houses bordering the railway tracks um, where uh, people who were occupying state lands were unable to get water connections because of the fact that uh, they didn't have a formal address. So when the household water connection came into being, 30 households occupying state lands adjacent to the railway tracks and four households belonging to residents of Sivalipura became paying users. Um, however, the paying users never, uh, never thought about restricting access to non-paying users. Um, and since its inception, uh, a fee of about 50 rupees was enough to pay for the water bill and still have a balance re remaining to buy detergent and equipment to keep the premises clean or to get the gully bowser down when the, uh, when the uh, toilet pit is full or to accumulate and pay for a future bill. Um, although collecting the fee and making the necessary payments is currently handled by Kumudini, it was or originally handled by Kamal's wife, uh, the person who came forward to, uh, as the owner of the uh, water connection. And between them, there were about five or six people who came forward to take responsibility and then gave up, particularly because of the amount of effort it takes. Uh, because once a bill is received, a per person rate is determined, and one would need to meet those who have used the tap often and collect a nominal fee from them. Um, and all of this is while no formal agreement is in place that binds a user to pay. Uh, how, uh, both Kumudini and Kama's wife mentioned that the decision is a subjective one and one which is solely based on whether a person has been seen using the tap often. Um, and uh, uh, Kumudini mentions that uh, there are some who actually make a payment even before the bill arrives, but many do not. But again, none of them uh, thought that they should uh, enact any form of communal policing that prevents anybody who doesn't pay from uh, accessing the tap. Apart from the physical and emotional labor that's needed um, to keep the tap and toilet running, uh, Kumudini also sees herself as bearing a disproportionate amount of risk as well due to her address being on, the, uh, uh, being, uh, being on the bill. And recently there was a dispute that erupted uh, between the paying users and her uh, because she had made a formal complaint to the water board mentioning that she feels that the meter is under measuring. For her, the risk of being fined at a later date by the water board for lost revenue was one that she was not willing to take.
rather than conflicts over payment, the most significant disruption to the operations of this water connection actually began in the month of May 2022. When the state began relocating people occupying state lands adjacent to the railway tracks to a high-rise apartment building built by the Colombo's Urban Regeneration Project. The Urban Regeneration Project, which is currently in operation and started uh, in 2010, was implemented to realize the objective of turning Colombo into a world-class city by relocating people living in tenement gardens to high-rise apartments and allocating these lands for more profitable users. The vision statement spells this uh, clearly uh, about liberating uh, lands to be utilized for commercial and mixed development and clearing the lands of uh, slums and shanties. With paying users drastically reducing with time and some of the remaining paying members working towards getting personal household connections, by uh, November 2022, Kumudini assumed that she might have to raise the per-person cost and also hinting at wanting to give up her responsibilities as well. However, later that month, she mentioned that uh, due to the increase in water tariffs, which happened in September 2022, and the ongoing economic crisis of the country, new paying users have been recruited to this uh, experimental project as well, thus extending this project's uh, lifespan. What I find particularly interesting in this hybrid formal informal setup is the procedural ambivalence of the norms that govern access and also ensures maintenance of the water connection on the ground. Because constraints on the ground, such as the user's capacity to pay, seem to shape, but not necessarily completely determine the way it is governed. After all, neither Kumudini nor Kama's wife ever expressed any interest in limiting access to non-paying users. There is also procedural ambivalence on the side of the state as well, in the manner in which the water board assigned responsibility for a water connection to a person not living at the address the water bill is dispatched to, with the connection being located in a toilet nobody in the community formally had any claim to either. Uh, an engineer in the non-revenue water department also described how it is uncommon, it's not uncommon for the water board to deviate sometimes from formal practices based on requests uh, made by people living in areas such as tenement gardens, followed by observations made by field staff who are then dispatched. The ambivalence to some extent seems to be due to this tacit understanding everybody has that rules applied universally across unequal conditions can lead to unfair outcomes. However, it is also important to keep in mind that provisioning is still contingent on the responsibility of exerting uh, the physical and emotional labor and bearing the risk of being answerable to the state being borne by a few which highlights that it isn't only equitability of access that's important to think about, but there is also equitability of effort and risk that's also important to think about. Finally, the case study also shows how people can organize among themselves to repurpose technologies deployed in pursuit of economic efficiency to reach a more public end. And with that, I would like to end. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I think this question of that you brought up right at the end about the fluidity between the formal and informal spaces um, and, and the way in which sort of state moves in and out uh, is, is actually a really interesting one. And it's something that I've been seeing in my own work around sort of larger infrastructure projects as well. And so it's, it's, really, it's something that I'd like to ask you later to reflect on is perhaps thinking a bit in, in this context across scale and how the, the question of, you know, from the, the small sort of individual um, aspect to all the way, you know, at perhaps the city level. Um, we'll now go back online. Uh, oh, sorry, no, it's Samuel now, sorry. Uh, so Samuel's right here. Yeah, Over to you. I, I guess I am. Um, thank you, uh, Neha, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you the, for the organizer uh, for having me, for the technical support today also. And thank you for everybody. Uh, to having found the courage to be here at that time of the day and that time of the week. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, should I speak? Okay, okay, sorry. I mean, that was not the most important part, so I guess that's fine. But thank you to everybody being here. Uh, so, yeah, I have to use this, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, okay. So this presentation uh, takes place uh, in a context where we are, uh, so to give some starting points, we're experiencing a large scale movement of digitization. And that includes uh, research also, where the digital is both uh, seen as a tool to measure things, but also as a transformative agent of space and uh, social practices. And a second uh, starting point is that in the domain, sorry, why is it changing? Okay. In the domain of uh, urban studies, it is also largely admitted that cities are now uh, considered as living objects and no longer fixed perimeters. And uh, in those objects, networks becomes the base units and fast circulation, one of the finalities of uh, city uh, development. So, which is this idea of space of flows. Uh, my own research uh, then tries to study the city of Delhi through the lens of such networks, uh, which include diseases circulation, so mainly dengue and uh, later on COVID, people movement and information circulation, because I'm studying mostly uh, numeric traces and big data. So method is a bit uh, different from my co-panelists, but I think it is bringing some uh, more diversity. Uh, so to make my uh, title a bit more explicit, it was something on the lines of making the uh, tangible intangible and the intangible tangible. Uh, my uh, questions that I will try to address here are uh, how can geospatial data help us understand such increasingly complex dynamics that we witness uh, in the urban setting? And conversely, how can it also distort our understanding of those same phenomena? And to answer that, I will provide a few examples uh, from my PhD uh, research that is uh, ongoing. Okay, so uh, I will start with the notion of uh, boundary and uh, centrality. And here I'm using two types of data. So on the left is the data on a built up surface. It comes from this uh, project called Global Human Settlement, which is a European uh, project. Uh, so uh, this is on the left. Huh? I, I created a buffer around all the built-up surface, and you can track uh, that way the evolution of uh, Delhi. And what is striking is that, um, indeed, the city, if you understand it as a built-up uh, continuum, outreaches way further uh, than its administrative uh, definition. And you can see that at several uh, steps in time. And if you think in terms of uh, governance and to, to fit in a bit with the the panel, uh, and especially in the domain of health governance, it's also showing areas of uh, contact between the city expansion and the neighboring ecosystems that are potentially some man-animal interface where pathogen can uh, be exchanged or are likely to occur. And uh, so, yeah, that's why I think it's important to keep track of such uh, evolutions with data. And another type of data I'm using in the middle uh, figure, uh, it is data on people uh, movement uh, provided by Facebook in the, the framework of, uh, I mean, an agreement we, we, we could have with them. And these are aggregated flows of users uh, from the Facebook platform uh, moving from places to others. And it really highlights uh, this idea of the, the city as a space of flow and a, a very, uh, uh, yeah, intense exchanges between places and a, a relational vision of space even. And on the right figure, using the same data, uh, I'm building a connectivity graph, uh, which is, I agree, a bit hard to decipher, but uh, those circles are uh, sub-districts of the area and they are uh, proportional to the quantity of incoming people. And those circles in gray account for sub-districts that are out of the Delhi uh, national capital uh, territory. That is the most uh, restrictive and administrative definition of Delhi. And those are uh, satellite towns such as uh, Gurgaon, Noida, Ghaziabad, uh, for those who know a bit of the, the context, that are somehow uh, dominant and overpowering uh, most of the central Delhi uh, sub-districts that you see in red in that graph. Uh, in terms of attractivity and centrality. So here the data is kind of uh, making tangible some recomposition of the urban space as it grows with changing uh, hierarchical structures and polarities. Um, yeah, coming to the next uh, slide and a bit in that uh, same idea, 
I'm here questioning the notion of scale still and of uh, boundary. And I find this uh, example quite uh, explicit regarding this uh, tangible, intangible dynamic of uh, geospatial data. Because uh, on this map, I've added, uh, so as I was mentioning, working on dengue, all those uh, dengue cases, uh, occurrences. These are the colored uh, dots that you see on the map. And I uh, combine it with this uh, data on people movement, those movement uh, flows. And it is telling somehow two stories that on one side, if you look at those dengue cases repartition, uh, they are accumulating alongside this border that you see between uh, Delhi, that is that gray area on the left, and uh, Ghaziabad, that is a, a neighboring uh, satellite uh, city, if I may say. And uh, yeah, so you can see that there is a border effect, that no record is kept about the, the cases that are occurring outside of Delhi border. And on the other hand, uh, those blue uh, flows showing the people uh, moving uh, are highlighting that there are still some intense exchange and commuting patterns on both sides, meaning that it is highly probable that the disease has been carried on both sides of the border. So this example shows how two layers of information can inform each other limits. In terms of health governance, it is also showing that we, uh, what could be an appropriate scale for a unified uh, surveillance system of diseases, rather than something that is puzzled across uh, administrative boundaries. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I, I'm trying here to question this notion of land use and how data can this time also bring a, a quite a different understanding in terms of dynamic uh, qualification of it. Because we tend to use often some categories that are rooted into the dominant occupation type of space, such as residential, commercial, uh, industrial, and so on. And we are not necessarily considering uh, the fact that uh, areas and segregation patterns can evolve all through the day, for example, or different temporalities. And uh, based on who or how many people are attending that place. And for example, here on that left uh, map, I'm again locating those dengue cases into a grid. And I will use, uh, as you see on the right, the, the movement data to try to qualify uh, those uh, grid cells based on their attendance profile. These are those uh, charts that you see just below the map, uh, basically showing different uh, time of the day and how many people are uh, incoming uh, as compared to the, the average uh, of the region. And uh, yeah, and so if you test uh, the association between this kind of classification and the uh, uh, dengue prevalence, uh, you end up having uh, this result that uh, areas that are highly attended in the evening are more prone to high dengue uh, prevalence as opposed to lesser attended ones who are mainly located in the outskirts of Delhi. So these are these ones in blue uh, that you see on the outskirts. And well, so, so, so that, that is showing that this dynamic classification can help understand this uh, question of disease spreading. And of course, we have to control for other factors, for example, how efficient is the detection system in those peripheral areas, or what kind of health uh, practitioners do people consult in those areas if they are uh, having dengue, will it be counted the same way as in other areas? So uh, this is simply to show that, yes, such kind of data make tangible uh, the changing dynamics of the place profiles, as opposed to very static and deterministic approaches of what is sometimes called the, the sleeping city in the, in the literature. And so, yeah. A last kind of uh, example I'm uh, trying to address here is uh, simply how to highlight uh, spatial inequalities at this larger scale of the, the agglomeration ar around a, such a massive city as Delhi. Uh, this example is taken from the, the COVID lockdown uh, situation, so the, in 2020 when it was just implemented. And the movement data uh, allows to quantify the decrease in people movement. That is one thing, but not very uh, informative. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, data highlights that a seemingly uniform health policy had a very differentiated, differentiated sorry, impact through the Delhi region. And on these maps uh, that you see on the right, where the darker uh, colors mean the lesser movement compared to a local pre-lockdown baseline and opposite for the uh, yellower. Uh, 
at different points of time, uh, you can see, for example, that movement has very sharply decreased in the South Delhi region, Gorgaon area. I'll try to make use of that pointer, sorry. So that is this area. And uh, whereas a whole yellowish crown is emerging in the periphery, as you see over here. Uh, running a regression on the movement index as outcome with variables from the census of India to explain it, we can retrieve a story of richer areas also concentrating jobs accessible remotely where people can easily avoid movement, uh, which was considered at risk at the time. And on the other, uh, on the, uh, sorry, other hand, rural uh, employment that is compelling you to presence on site with a possible increase in movement also due to the return uh, of migrating population in the villages toward the later stages of the lockdown. So uh, this is to show that the movement data is also uh, in a socio-spatial context uh, and, and with the help of census data, you can make tangible some very differentiated uh, spatial dynamics under the same, seemingly same constraints. And uh, yeah, this also drives us to, to, to address this question of the digital divide because we've been using uh, this data without questioning much about who is really uh, represented with this data. And um, yeah, this, uh, when we are mapping the, the ratio of users uh, from this Facebook data as compared to the census population, we're having a geography of the lack of representativity in the data. You have different uh, ratios across space. And mainly women, uh, rural workers, marginal workers, elder people uh, tend to be lesser uh, represented. And especially it mostly translates into a high ratio in the fast growing periphery of Delhi, plus uh, some central districts and lesser uh, ratios into the wider periphery. And uh, if we refer to the previous example of the COVID lockdown, those you measure better are also those who move sometimes less because they can mediate the distance through technology and accessing resource uh, remotely. And on the other hand, those who got constrained to movement who have uh, jobs needing on-site presence or those in case of return migrations are yet not that well represented in the data. So one really has to have in mind that there are some very specific and socially uh, connoted uh, limitations to consider. And we are able to, from the data, identify where there is a lack of representativity. But to tell the story of those areas uh, call for other ways of investigation, uh, such as using other source of data, but also, of course, field work and ethnographic uh, work. And this shows, again, how ambiguous is this uh, uh, tangible, intangible nature of large-scale uh, data. So to wrap up uh, quickly, uh, having focused rather on what the data shows, I have to mention the factors that are rather pushing for the intangible aspect, and mainly due to a series of normative assumptions that are driving the data production. Uh, first, large-scale providers have little consideration for the locale and, and have very definite ideas regarding what is movement, in terms of what distance, how long, and, and so on. And same uh, goes for the health uh, data, as I was uh, mentioning. Uh, temporality is often very immediate. It's, it's often a crisis temporality uh, to release this data. And that leaves lesser room for the longitudinal observation of tendency or larger spatial temporal scales of movement, quite typically uh, migration flows that take place on several month cycles. Uh, then comes this idea of massification of data and that tend to depict the world as a smooth, uh, hyper-connected space that is accessible to all. Whereas mobility, and which does not equal movement, I think uh, Vidisha's presentation was also addressing that, uh, is an ability whose modalities respond to forms of individual's capital uh, then able to arbitrate between movement or stationarity. And I would relate this problem of invisibility of certain population and practices in the data with what uh, yeah, Sanjay Srivastava described in Entangled Urbanism, his book, uh, stating that the mechanisms of inclusion and exclusions also interplays in the field of visibility and invisibility, which reflects in the digital uh, space in our case. And very, very quickly, I'm rushing through this, uh, yeah, to, to link a bit with the, the governance uh, outcomes. Uh, this matter of visibility in the digital space is a matter of being in the scope of public policies. And I would argue that data and policy based on those are often designed after dominant uh, lifestyles. So here in the case of our data, it's uh, the urban commuter who can work from home and so on. 
uh, which is a bit similar with the idea of uh, the, the, the city telling its own story and promoting some uh, pop group of population having a high symbolic capital. And uh, yeah, I will then wrap up very quick on this. Uh, context. Okay, so yeah, having data rooted in the context, I, I was trying to show also like how to rethink uh, scale and uh, governance through networks. And finally, uh, yeah, using this concept coined in by Pyle uh, Aurora, that the digital and physical space are tethered uh, to each other. And I guess they now can't be considered two separately. Uh, one is really informing the other in the urban context, and this proper articulation is really what can help us on our journey towards making everything more tangible. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, it, it's fascinating. I think it echoes a lot uh, of work that we've been doing at IHS for a while, and I think um, something that we've tried to kind of find workarounds for our how to um, do this kind of work with, with large data sets, particularly in data poor environments um, like, like Indian cities. And also again, bringing back to the question of the scale at which data is produced and reproduced. Um, so on to our final presenter, Sumedha, over to you. Hi, just sharing my screen. Yeah, so good evening to everyone. Um, and since it's my last presentation, uh, I hope that you don't get bored right now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so hi, I'm Sumedha. This is the title of my presentation, which is Creation of the Sanitary Regime, a case study of the role of the street-level bureaucrats in the everyday sanitation infrastructural governance in a planned residential sector of Gurgaon. Now, let me take you through Gurugram a little bit. Uh, so Gurugram is also known as the Millennial City of India. It is a part of Delhi, the uh, national capital region. Now, Gurugram encapsulate the stark realities of urban India, where uh, some parts of the Gurugram, which is also known as the old Gurugram, depicts the old India, which is congested, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, aesthetically structured, whereas the new Gurugram is uh, an epitome or a vision of the new India. Now, what is very interesting about Gurugram is the two contrasting trends, which is evident, especially in the nature of the state, where on one hand, you see that the state is continuously creating new state bodies. And at the same time, it is also promoting the involvement of private agencies for urban development. Now, uh, Guru Rani, who is one of the uh, researchers who has worked on Guru Gram's urban development, has noted or characterized the planning and governance in Guru Gram as the one which is flexible in nature. What she means by flexibility in planning and governance is basically the involvement of uh, you know, private agencies in the delivery of public services and the due course of which exceptions and exemptions are created, especially for the elites. We'll discuss about this further, uh, you know, in the course of my presentation. What we also see over here is that the pattern of urban development in Gurugram follows the middle class aesthetic sensibilities. And there is a speculative logic, which is very much evident in the pattern of the urban development. Now, what, uh, what I mean over here by urban, uh, uh, sorry, by speculative logic is the idea which uh, Goldman has used, in which the state is seen to have been disinvested from the uh, process of urban development and merely acts as a broker. We'll discuss about this further uh, in the course of the uh, presentation. Now, the sanitation situation in Gurugram is extremely dismal. Uh, oftentimes, it is described as a city without sewers. Um, this is uh, actually the master sewerage planning of uh, Gurugram. The green lines which is uh, which are present indicate the sectors, the residential sectors and the areas which are connected with the uh, sewer lines, with the master sewer lines. And the ones in magenta depict the ones which have to uh, be connected, which still have to be connected. But there are, is a possibility that there would be human settlements in these areas already. Now, my objective is to explore the role functioning 
practices and challenges of the street level bureaucrats in the everyday sanitation infrastructural uh, governance. Uh, the site for study is a planned residential sector, which is sector 15 part two. I aim to analyze the dynamic operative sanitary regulation over here. And through it, I would also delve into broadening my theoretical understanding of what I mean by conceived space and how sanitation infrastructure can be understood as a social product. Now, uh, let me brief you a little about, uh, you know, the planning and governance pattern in Gurukram. So there are around four uh, state bodies which are currently operative in uh, the realm of planning and governance, which is GMDA, HUDA, MCG, and the Town and Country Planning Department. Um, all these four bodies tend to outsource the task or, uh, related to, uh, you know, urban development to private agencies and developers. Uh, now, this is the sewer map of Sector 15 Part 2. As you can see, uh, Sector 15 Part 2, I've highlighted it in uh, yellow. I don't know if it is visible in the background out there. But if you see, it is very well connected with the master sewer lines. And uh, if you see, it, it has uh, it's connected to uh, uh, Dhanmapur uh, sewage treatment plant, which is lying around at the top. Uh, sector 104 has it. Now, so, uh, let me just uh, walk you through sector 15 part 2. Sector 15 part 2 comprises of plot houses, um, the planning and installation of uh, infrastructures was done by HUDA, which is Urban, uh, uh, Haryana Urban Development Planning Authorities, and most of the installation of sewer lines has been done prior to the settlements of uh, residents. The governance is taken care by the Municipal Corporation of Gurukram. Now, re uh, recently, uh, MCG had come up with a new development rule, which allowed the double-story plot houses to be converted into multi-story building. Now, this created a lot of uh, uh, impact on the already uh, overburdened infrastructure, as noted by most of the residents who had interviewed. Now, the role of the street level bureaucrats over here becomes very, uh, uh, you know, interesting to note down uh, because it is the street level bureaucrats who are continuously in, um, you know, interaction, who are continuously interacting with the residents of the uh, sector. Now, the street level bureaucrats comprise of the subdivisional officer, the junior engineer, field supervisor, and the sewerman, and all of them belong to the municipal corporation of Gurukram. Now, the aim over here is to create a garbage free city and to maintain cleanliness. Now, cleanliness is also uh, defined on three axes that cleanliness should be visible, it should be quantified, and also territorialized. Now, the publics tend to make negotiations and complain through various ways. They either do it individually through RWAs or collectively through groups. And mostly the complaint revolves around you know, cleanliness maintenance. Now, these are the uh, multi-story buildings which have come up in Sector 15, Part 2. So these were the plot houses which have now been converted or are being converted into multi-story buildings. Now, the engineering wing of uh, Municipal Corporation of Gurugram is in charge of the everyday sanitation infrastructure. The chief engineer uh, is at the top and the sewerman is at the, you know, the lowest rung of the hierarchy. Uh, the, Subdivisional officer, junior engineer, field supervisor, and the sewermen are the ones who are continuously taking rounds of the sector in case of any complaint making. Now, let's understand the role and functioning of the SLBs. I'll be using uh, SLBs as an acronym for uh, you know, street level bureaucrats. They have a supervisory role. Uh, they have on field supervision. The maintain they are involved in maintenance work, which revolves around cleaning, repair, and upgradation. They are um, actually involved in providing instant solution or quick fixes. Now, let's understand what are the working and challenges of the SLBs. They are under excessive workload. Uh, the uh, this culture of quick fix is actually continue has led to a continued existence of pressure points in the sewer lines. There are lack of resources. At, uh, the fact of the matter is that the SLBs do not have access to the layout of the sewer lines. They have access to none of the plans. So the question lies: How is it that they operate? So basically, the SLBs are operating through tacit knowledge, which is basically their experiential knowledge. And this also comes with its own drawback. 
And the drawback over here is one of the major ones which was pointed out by SLBs themselves was that when the officials are either rotated or when they retire. So that creates a kind of a lacuna. And because of this, there is definitely a kind of of challenge uh, created for the operational uh, for the operation of the SLBs. Now, what the SLBs also pointed out that there is lack of coordination between different wings of MCG um, and uh, GLD. Now, one of the points which uh, SLBs noted was that because of the drift and the challenges that they have been facing, they are often alienated from work. Now, this alienation from work that just does not crop up because of the nature of their working and challenges, but it's also um, a resultant of the pattern of urban development, which we'll discuss now. So this is actually one of the rough drawings which had uh, requested one of the SLBs to make. So they had made this uh, running rough map for me, which shows uh, you know the sewer, the spread of the sewer lines. Now this uh, this is actually a case when um, there was a private agency, a telecom uh, agency, which was laying down its uh, lines, and because they were unaware of where the sewer lines were, it let uh, while they were working, you know, one of the sewer lines had burst, and now this was the fix up that was happening. Now, the pattern which is noted over here is that the SLBs are basically a cog in the wheel. And this is also because of the fact that there is definitely an existence of informality. And this inform the informality or the existence of informal practices, which is based on the fact that, you know, any practices that is serving development or serving the elites is sort of continued or is normalized. So this is also promoting, uh, you know, the continuation of flexible governance and speculative urbanism. Um, there is, uh, which Amita Bhavaskar talks as bourgeois environmentalism, that despite of the repercussion that, uh, uh, you know, the practices might have on environment or public health is completely neglected and normalized because, you know, it is serving the larger, uh, you know, aspect of, uh, you know, urban development. Now, the conceptualization and imagination of sanitation infrastructure is basically based on the tacit knowledge of the SLBs, in, especially in the realm of everyday governance. Um, the everyday negotiations involves around informal practices, but it is also uh, socializing the publics to the expectation. The way the SLBs are working is uh, socializing the publics to the expectations of the state services. Now, an important dimension to citizenship is also, um, you know, uh, uh, promoted over here, where, you know, citizenship is just not about, you know, rights and duties, but it is also about right to claim making, where to, uh, which actually forms the basis of the existence of informal practices. Now, what we actually see over here is that there is blurring of boundary between formal and informal. Um, the imagination of sanitary infrastructure by the SLBs is indicative of how the conceived space itself is an amalgamation or a range of formal to informal practices, which is continuously converted as modus operandi. And the rules and regulations and representation, when all of them come together, they make the sanitation infrastructure as a social product. Now, the SLBs are also, you know, uh, actually depicting the invisible presence of the state because, you know, the SLBs are always present. And having said that, there is flexibility in governance and all these things. But, you know, the role of SLBs still cannot be overlooked. So I think I'm exceeding the time limit. So I would end with this. So thank you. Thanks, Sumedha, and uh, thank you all, actually, for keeping exactly the time. Um, that leaves us a good half an hour for um, the Q&A. Um, so folks online, if you could start putting your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and meanwhile, Sumedha, actually, I'd like you to perhaps think a little bit about, um, and reflect. I was really curious to hear more from you about your work and the interaction between the street <coughs> level bureaucrats and you know bureaucrats at other scale, um, particularly given you know the involvement of Huda, of uh, you know the, the relationship that it has with various other governing agencies, um, 
in and around there and also to think about sort of their relationship with the communities themselves right so how do they interact not not just the state role but the role of the whole sort of variety of non state actors that are involved in the process of of uh, sanitation um but we'll open it up to questions in the room hari uh hi uh my question is for samuel so uh samuel uh it was one of your last slides you uh you you said the context that like your data was not really representative of like low socio economic uh neighborhoods uh and so my question to you is that then how do you uh contextualize your initial findings uh where you uh correlate the mobility with the the presence of disease cases and like did you find any islands where uh like the the number of cases were high even though like your the mobility like were there islands where you saw uh, your mobility data not being representative of like high number of cases and my second question to you was uh, basically uh, so so that uh, now that we have established that the data is not really uh, uh, representative in areas of low socio economic uh, uh, like households then have you thought about like how would you want to fill in those gaps through alternate data sets uh and like did you look at any other proxy data uh to fill in those gaps to 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 better contextualize your study yeah um thank you for very interesting presentations um uh my question is to chanaka um that was a really interesting case study i'm a little curious about the politics on the ground the local level politics a little bit more um so one is like the the settlement that you spoke about um you know how heterogeneous or you know are there sort of different identities that you know that you know what what does that that look like in in when 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 you know single person has you know access or uh, to that uh, to uh, to the water tap and the second part is that you spoke about the risk you know basically the risk being transferred onto like a single person because they're more visible to the state um and so i'm also curious whether there's the reverse is also possible where there's a certain power that this person also holds um given that um or or that they're able to exert over you know their neighborhood given that um uh you, you know sort of that that uh, given that they're taking on risk for others so is there there are, are there other things that you saw playing out given that they were taking on external risk sort of you know like how financing works you know um so so i'm just curious to know a little bit more about that hello am i audible uh so yeah my question is for sakshi so uh particularly i was interested to know that we know that environment and development go hand in hand and uh, that is where the role of uh, natural solutions can take place and uh, uh, like there uh, there are natural we can take advantage of that as well so i wanted to understand that Uh, uh what are the comments uh, what are your comments on that and the second aspect was uh, understanding that any sort of development would take place in such uh, uh, like uh, either we talk about the encroachments uh, that uh, that is happening you know uh, near the uh, you know, wetland areas or uh, like that so uh, uh, how flexible can be in that terms so that was the uh, question for sakshi so just one second uh, could you like uh, reiterate your question because i uh, what i understood from your question is that you want to know that uh, you know how we can uh, like save the environment through uh, like you know through the policies right so i just That's just uh, concise uh, like uh, uh the so could the question was first on how we can utilize the na natural solutions to develop and take advantage of the economical opportunities the second one was to understand that uh, you know uh, like obviously the encroachments that we are talking about if we you know in some sort of a, a manner we try to constrain it it's it would still happen so how uh, flexibly can we you know address that that is how, what i want to know through like your your comments on that basically thank so, you so so we take a round of responses and then maybe come back for question so um i don't know sam if you want to start so should we answer it uh, so can we or uh, yeah, step Sarah, by just, step um we just take responses in the room and then come to you guys online 
Okay, okay, great. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> to address this question of uh, representativity, so thank you for, for, for your question. Uh, well, so to, to contextualize it a bit more, rather than low and high income, it, the picture is a bit more uh, complicated. I, I would say it is not representing well a rural population, for sure, uh, and marginal uh, population, the mar marginal workers. Um, yeah, it, it's not exactly an income, lower income. Uh, even you, you wouldn't find a, a cost effect, for example. You, it's not very visible uh, in the data. So I think how to address it is first to know where uh, are these limitations and uh, to avoid this yeah, positivistic approach of saying, okay, my data is saying this, so this is how it is. So yeah, knowing where are the, the, the limitations of the, the, the prediction we are, we are uh, making. Although uh, I think it's still a very good proxy, honestly, for what is the uh, urban setting, like the core uh, of the city. And uh, you wouldn't find necessarily, to my knowledge, much better in terms of such a wide uh, data set that is also uh, very homogeneous in the way it is collected and so on, which is very important with data. And sometimes you're struggling with smaller data set that have different ways of being uh, built. Um, coming to the alternative sources, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure some other uh, social media platforms even would have a different kind of a signature in terms of social uh, bias. Uh, I, before its ban, uh, TikTok, for example, was very popular among uh, even rural workers and so on because, you know, it had this very uh, direct way of providing content uh, that maybe Facebook is a bit lesser good at. Um, I'm thinking also about the geo uh, phones, which are also very uh, popular uh, across all sections of the population. Uh, I'm yet to know if this data will be released or not, or accessible or not. This I, I, I can't tell, but that would be a source that I would be willing to to investigate. Uh, yeah, and 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 then there is, yeah, the, the field work and so on. But to to work on such scales, it, it is honestly a bit difficult to to grasp such. A, but uh, yeah, maybe in the idea of applying some corrective, uh, giving a particular setting, you know that you might have to give a coefficient to 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 have some numbers that are closer to to reality of those uh, mobility uh, flows. So uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your. Uh, ah, yeah, and there was a question about uh, low measured uh, movement levels and high uh, dengue incidence. Uh, I can tell you a bit about the northeast uh, part of Delhi. Those, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Delhi, but those uh, Shadra district, uh, Silampur, Simapuri, um, which, for which we definitely don't have the best representation of data. So uh, yet it is to understand if it's lesser level of movement or actual lack of uh, representativity of data. But there you would have some high uh, dengue incidence. Uh, also considering that the dengue data is now a bit dated because as you know, Delhi was, there was this tripartition. So then it was three different, uh, it, it used to be one corporation, then it, it became divided by three. So to access the dengue data, you had to go through all three and not where uh, they were not all as willingly uh, giving the data. So yeah, now we are back to, uh, yeah single uh, corporation, so let's see how it changes things. I, I hope that answers. Um, so to answer the first question that was asked about uh, scale, I mean, it, scale is something that's quite interesting to think about um, because Complexity is always fractal in these kinds of uh, complex systems where when you look at it at the high level, there's this level of complexity. When you zoom in, complexity doesn't necessarily uh, reduce. You see a different level of complexity that comes, uh, comes into focus. So at the high level, you get this James C. Scott kind of way of thinking about the state, which uh, is this very nebulous kind of uh, structure of power uh, which is very rigid in its operations. But when you zoom in, you kind of see this discretionary openings, which people kind of like find a bit of wiggle room. So yeah, it was quite interesting to see that. 
Um, to answer Ruchika's question, um, I mean, Sivalipura is predominantly Sinhalese, but there are uh, Tamil and Muslim people living there as well. Um, I'm not too sure how ethnicity colors the politics. Um, I did get to speak uh, because um, the profile of the paying uh, users has changed drastically. Um, so by the time I started trying to meet people, they have already shifted. And I haven't been able to meet uh, a large population of them. Um, but uh, I did get to speak one uh, Tamil person from Sivalipura who is one of the paying users. And he seemed quite happy and said that he pays the uh, bill on time and he doesn't really uh, expect any kind of accountability measures. She say, he says, I trust Kumudini to do the, the right, uh, uh, to do uh, what's uh, right. Um, but to talk about politics in general about this, it seems very, it's, it's a very amb ambivalent kind of a form of governance. Uh, when I asked about Kama's wife about, you know, how do you decide how, uh, who pays, who doesn't, um, not everybody who is one of the paying members needs to pay uh, to, uh, to match the amount on the bill. Um, so I was trying to decide, okay, how do you decide who is gonna pay this month, who's gonna pay that month? Um, she almost threw a conversation in at me by saying, um, like basically saying, we don't have formal meetings. I meet people in my day-to-day -day, uh, movement in this community. I meet them at the corner shop as I walk along the lane. So this is how we decide, we, this is how we negotiate. And of course there is room for deceit as well. Um, but again, I mean, it's what's fascinating is how there doesn't seem to be any form of communal policing that has sort of emerged from this kind of form of governance. I don't know whether I answered your question. Yeah. Uh, Sakshi? If you're yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, so uh, coming back to the uh, question that was asked, so I, I would first like to start with the encroachments question. Uh, like, uh, as I also mentioned in my presentation, uh, there's a lot of ambivalence and, uh, you know, there's a lot of blame shifting in the process which is related to leaks. So what is actually happening that because, uh, like, just uh, like I mentioned, the word buffer itself also has four different definitions for BBMP, PDA, and, uh, you know, NGT. So what happens is that actually, uh, we cannot even say that, you know, somebody is doing it deliberately. But uh, what is happening is that uh, there's so much of, uh, you know, um, like unclear laws and policies because of which people are not being able to understand that you know whether whether the buffer should be 30 meter whether it should be 45 meter so that is why encroachments are happening in the first place the second part uh, would be like how can we actually uh, you know uh, like avoid encroachments for that we would have to have clearer clearer uh, law and policy which has to be you know one law for the whole country or probably for the whole city that for Bangalore, there would be 45 meter buffer, you know, or something of that sort. So that is one thing. The other part would be uh, like, what are the sort of natural solutions uh, that should uh, help the lakes and tanks of Bangalore? So there are a lot of ecologists and researchers who are already working on, you know, things like algae islands. So this has happened in some of the lakes. So these algae islands are actually helping uh, to, you know, clean the lakes. Uh, what is happening is they leave these algae, uh, uh, you know, groups of algae plants into the lake. These are like floating islands and it actually cleans the lake, uh, which is one of the natural solution uh, that is coming into picture these days. So do I answer your question or do you want to know something else as well? I think you uh, really answered my question. So thank you. Thank you for answering. Okay. And, and coming back to the first question uh, that ma'am, you on, like on the panel that you asked. So uh, like when it comes to policy, uh, you know, uh, so what is happening that 
like because of the ambivalence so uh, these things uh, you know are happening and uh, mm-hmm. like the low lying topography you were talking about policy and floods so i think i answer that that due to the plurality in the policy there is a loophole on the system concerning the governance of lakes there is not enough diligent work as of environmental impact assessment which is done before transferring lakes as vacant land for development however the low lying topography proves itself right when it drains and water has nowhere to go on concretized land so uh, then it actually floods these low lying areas thank you thanks akshi uh, sumeda yeah so thank you for the question neha i think uh, it actually opens up the presentation and the points that i actually had not highlighted well in my presentation so uh, definitely actually the interaction that slbs have with their higher uh, you know uh, officials is very interesting and uh, it can be actually analyzed on multiple um, points so one is actually on the basis of caste um uh, then you know one uh, it's all i can also analyze it on the basis of who is on the ground who's working on the ground and who's uh, you know sitting in the office and working um the other is one which is also very interesting is to point out that uh, regardless of this of any kind of interaction that persists there is always a strict hierarchy that is maintained be it on the uh, lines of cast or be it on lines of you know who is uh, working indoors versus who is working outdoors or be it you know the bureaucratic hierarchy which is sort of existent so uh, let me uh, make you uh, make this um, uh, clear by one of the examples so i think this is an anecdote which i also used in my presentation but i did not read it out so i was uh, speaking to uh, you know the field supervisor and i asked uh, him that you know how is your work should you like for how many hours do you work so this person uh, told me that you know there is no fixed working hours and then i asked him that why do you say so so he uh, quoted in the incident he said that you know it was at 3 in the night when i started getting call from my sdo and uh, the sdo st- said that you know you have to reach this point uh, right now because you know this person has been complaining and he said that you know there were multiple calls and because the sdo also reached the field site i had to anyway go so they provided a quick fix at that time and then they moved back the other question which i asked him the trail one was that who was the person who was calling the sdo because you know at 3 in the night what you know made the sdo also go on the field site so this person said that this was an influential person of the resident who actually had somebody you know in the government and you know that was one who was very well connected so what you what is also very important to note over here is that how uh, you know does the societal interactions is also mimicked in the way you know the slbs and the you know higher officials are interacting so you know there is uh, uh, because somebody who is elite so who has social cultural or economic power or capital you know is you know exuding some kind of force on uh, you know the officials and that, that somewhat there's a trickle down effect and that percolates and everyone has to do the other is also about the caste system now amongst uh, the technocrats if i may say like you know the field supervisor the sea woman and the assistant engineer uh what i saw that you know they were sitting together in the same room that everyone was sitting on the chair and uh, you know one when the uh, subdivisional officer came in you know uh, the civil man was the first one to stand up because you know down the hierarchy and also you know the caste angle was something which i would couldn't have overlooked the other was that how he uh, this person was in the slb was interacting with the counselor of the sector so the counselor completely turned there were you know in a room i was waiting for the counselor and uh, you know the the civil man was there and the counselor completely ignored the existence of civil man and just greeted me and you know ignored his greet so of course there is an existent uh, you know caste hierarchy which is also present but amongst the technocrats especially the field supervisor and the sewermen the kind of uh, you know uh, caste 
practices was not very much highlighted. So, of course, you know, the interactions could be read on multiple lines. Now, talking about the non-state body interactions, so, you know, something which I've already pointed out that, you know, there is definitely the existence of social and political power which is existed while, you know, the SLBs and the non-state bodies are interacting. Uh, the reason why I call them a cog in the wheel is also because, you know, they, in some way or the other, they have to, uh, you know, uh, go, uh, they, they have to go with, you know, the pattern which is existent in the development process. But having said that, you know, their role is so indelible that, you know, if it is on the street bureaucrats, you know, the informal normalized practices, because these are the people who are actually aware of the on, uh, on uh, ground reality. So, you know, if... Uh, you know, it is on them. They can actually expose a lot, of, a lot of things because they have so much of knowledge and information. But it's not that they are not exercising their agency. There's the negotiation that is going around. You know, it is give and take, which is definitely existent. So, you know, they are given in some kind of, uh, there's an exchange in some kind of kind, present during festivals. Uh, so that is also existent. And they have also a very close interaction with the private agencies, which have been outsourced sourced because you know there is a uh, non-availability or um, uh, you know the resources like maps and outlines of sewer lines are not accessible to the, uh, a lot of people so you know these are the people who become extremely important in the everyday governance because it is the operationalization of their tacit knowledge which is actually uh, letting the you know the operationalization of the entire governance model so yeah thank you for the question thanks so much Samantha. um thanks. I'm very aware that we stand between you and your uh, Saturday evening, but I just wanted to check if uh, there were any more questions uh, online or in the room. Yeah, yes. Um, so a question for Samuel is um, I, just reflecting on the, you know, maybe you just draw together the insights you offered us during your talk on the relationship between static data and the interest in flows, you know, so that seemed to be quite a tension. So your, uh, your, your research is trying to understand these different flows, but you've got like data set someplace. Um, <clears throat> so maybe just a reflection on that methodologically and a corollary would be, if you were to do it again, how would you proceed? Would you do something different? to try and understand flows. Um, uh, you know, if you started again, would you do the same thing? <laughs> and I had a question for Sumedha, which was, um, I just wondered about, you know, these are really interesting practices, uh, the negotiations between the different actors and so on around maintaining the sewage uh, system. But I just wondered if you had any evidence about those places which have not been provided yet, and how does the, you know, how does the system of street level bureaucrats and 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 what's going on in the rest of the city uh, affect? Uh, their activities and uh, impact on the, the broader area. Because obviously it's impactful if some people have no sewage, but their settlements emerging. How is that being managed? Yeah. So sorry to take us on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So thanks, Jennifer, for this question or en entertainment, as you as you were mentioning. Uh, <laughs> If I had to start again, uh, does it mean that I should start again? No. <laughs> so what what I uh, what point I tried to make with this uh, dynamic uh, qualification of land use? I I think, well, uh, ideally, I'd like to have a classification that is taking those evolving uh, patterns all through the day, and that you can link with uh, the functionality of the area. I'm guessing there are some signatures of uh, attendance, footfall, that are very uh, specific of, uh, let's say, residential areas or, or so and so, but that you would qualify with, uh, yeah, um, something that is a bit more true to the functional reality of the place all through the day. And ideally, uh, also reflecting on uh, the kind of uh, attendance that the place is receiving. Um, seeing where the people are coming from, and in the case of uh, health uh, policies, it's also 
Are they coming from areas that are themselves prone to uh, health risks? And how is this risk being uh, distributed? So, yeah, I, I, ideally, I'd like to have maybe a, a classification that is meeting those two uh, aspects of having something that is temporarily dynamic and that you can link to uh, yeah, a, a relational, a relational uh, classification that, that you can relate to yeah, search certain uh, functions in, in the, the network, uh, the city as a network. Uh, I don't know if that answers your, <laughs> your, your question, but uh, yeah. Asumed. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so actually, you know, this uh, presentation is a small bit of my PhD research work. And this is one of the planned uh, colonies uh, or residential sectors that I've been looking at, which has which is well connected with the master's you line. But the other sector in my PhD research, uh, which I've been looking at is the one which is not connected with the master's you lines and people have already settled over there. And this very sector, which is not connected to the master's sewer lines has been developed in patches by real estate uh, development uh, uh, you know companies and uh, the realtors so what happens in these sectors is that all of these uh, societies or these uh, societies which are the residential societies which have been developed by these real estate developers they as per uh, you know the haryana uh, urban development regulatory act they have to make sure that an stp is installed a sewage treatment plant is installed within their society and uh, within the society they have a network sewage line but Despite of that, the problem is that, you know, the sewage treatment plant is generally not well equipped to process the wastewater that is uh, generated on everyday basis. And uh, here lies the informal practice is that, you know, whatever waste which is untreated by these uh, sewage treatment plants within the society, uh, these uh, societies are actually informally injected in the stormwater drainage system of the city and um, going by what the uh, you know the environmentalists and the experts and even the residents have pointed out is that because of this injection of the sewer uh, untreated sewer water in the stormwater drainage system you know the, uh, uh, the this is one of the reasons why gurugram uh, I think annually faces a dilute kind of a situation uh, whenever there is a spell of rain you know there is a flood like situation in the city now coming to the role of SLBs. Now, what is also interesting over here is that you know these sectors which are not connected to the master sewer lines are also not under the municipal corporation of Gurgram yet. So uh, the state bodies are not providing them, you know, the services, the state sponsored services, and all are being regulated by you know, these real estate developers, which are, uh, you know, pseudo states, we can say that. So uh, they have their own set of uh, bureaucrats, or we, uh, we can call them technocrats, which uh, work in a um, very uh, state, uh, which work, you know, just the way the state operates. So the model is that of the state and the technocrats are working just the way the technocrats of the MCGs would work. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we'll close. Thank you all very much on the panel here and those online and uh, everyone who's been attending. Uh, this also closes out uh, Urban Arc for this year. It's been a real pleasure to have everyone back in the room and on campus and uh, we'll be back next January, so see you all then. <laughs>